When I first started watching House of the Dragon, I thought the world building lesson I'd take from the show would be grandiose, just like the show itself. Perhaps something about the social politics of owning fire breathing dragons, or perhaps the sheer difference in house influence between this time and Game of Thrones' Westeros. But no, what caught my attention was this. I'll admit, I'll admit. The first time King Viserys' room popped up, I thought it was some huge Warhammer 40k miniature reference. Something just to connect with this audience, but I was very wrong. Eventually I noticed that this whole room, this whole setup, is part of a clever world building device they used to symbolize, in a subtle way, a very important motif. History and particularly how the different Targaryens have complex relationships with their family's legacy. Today we're going to explore some of those scenes and pay special attention to the physical manifestations, to the tokens that represent those relationships with history and legacy. Shall we? Ah, world building, this narrative connective tissue that makes a story about the king of the house of the dragon and another story about an invasion of the ice zombies from the north that happens over a hundred years after that feel part of the same universe, of the same grand story. The whole point of this series here is to better understand world building and not just from a theoretical standpoint, it is to present exercises so that we can create thousands of worlds and get better and better at creating them with each different try. So welcome to the world building tower. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I hope that you grow as a writer, as an artist, as an enthusiast. If you haven't heard yet, I started a TikTok also about fantasy writing and world building. I'm Jorian Ramos over there and I gotta say, I'm having a lot of fun. <laughs> also, I did a collaboration video with my good friend and giant YouTuber, Chill Barup. Uh, it's over at a channel and together we're exploring some Magic the Gathering world building and it's really, really fun. You know what else is really fun? House of the Dragon. By the way, this episode will contain spoilers for the first two episodes and some footage from the other episodes, but nothing, nothing too major, nothing complicated. How do you deal with the past, and especially when you're in a position of power, where you're constantly reminded that you're not only living the present, you're building history. Whatever you do will be written down and remembered, perhaps even sung, but will it be an epic tale or a mocking satire? The Targaryen we get to know in Game of Thrones already shows us how complex this relationship with the past can get. Daenerys needed no king to legitimize herself. She knew she belonged to a long line of rulers, so she played her part accordingly. Every time somebody tried to treat her as less than a queen, she wouldn't compromise. She understood her lineage's place in the world. But at the same time, she was a progressist, anti-tradition, and nothing represents this better than her anti-slavery policies. See? That's not a two-dimensional relationship with the past. It's not just it was better before or it was horrible before. It's not that simple. And this complex relationship, it's similar to the ones we have. Perhaps you really love the ornamented facade of old Dutch buildings, but you think that super narrow stairs are ridiculous. Perhaps you have conflicting emotions because you like the idea of reviving the archetype of the gentleman attitude, but you also believe that in many ways it disempowers women, and that is unacceptable. Perhaps the art of the 15th century masters is your favorite, your jam. But you also believe the world of fine arts is more interesting to everyone with the multiplicity that came about in the 19th century. See? 
This is more than just in the old days it was better or it was worse. It's a relationship with many facets to it. And those multifaceted relationships with history is exactly what House of the Dragon tried to bring us. Today we're gonna have a look at three different scenes from the first two episodes of the show, each showing a little moment. Nothing too big, nothing too dramatic, just small snippets of those relationships and how they were somewhat turned into objects. Yes, pieces of the world, physical tokens that represent history in various ways. Let's have a look. I bought you something, said Daemon, switching back from Old Valyrian to the common tongue of Westeros, and thus breaking their little insurrecting game. He extended his right hand, revealing a necklace. Rhaenyra held its centerpiece ruby, her brow furrowing as she did so. Do you know what it is? It's Valyrian steel, she said softly, like Dark Sister. At the mention of his sword's name, Daemon pulled the necklace back. Rhaenyra knew better than to challenge her uncle, so she just crossed her hands behind her back, allowing him to measure her reaction. Turn around, he commanded. With only a moment's hesitation, the princess turned and held her hair to the side. Now, he told her as he placed the necklace around her neck and fastened the clasp on the back, you and I both own a small piece of our ancestry. She smiled slightly at that and turned around. Beautiful, he said, switching back to old Valyrian. Complicated, right? They're both proud to own the pieces of their ancestry. But there's also something uncomfortable about it. And seeing that necklace in Rhaenyra's neck will remind us, the audience, of that pride and discomfort every time it pops up. Now let's have a look at a snippet of a scene that happens right after the one we just read. This one I had to alter a little bit just so I could make it smaller. I hope you don't mind my poetic freedom. Let's have a look. Did you read it? asked Alicent, flipping the pages of a huge tome balanced on top of her left leg. Of course I read it, replied Rhaenyra, depetaling a flower absentmindedly, her head leaning on Alicent's right leg. Alicent flipped the pages of the book until she found the beginning of a new chapter, the first letters beautifully illustrated in gold and blue. She quickly skimmed the pages and asked, When Princess Nymeria arrived in dawn, who did she take to husband? A man. What was his name? A lord something. Rhaenyra's flower had but three petals to spare. If you answer with lord something, Septimalo will be furious. She's funny when she's furious, said the princess, smiling. Lady Alicent didn't smile. You're always like this when you're worried. Princess Rhaenyra finally looked up from her single petaled toy. Like what? Disagreeable. The two ladies exchanged a glance. Alicent's eyebrows raised, Rhaenyra's maimed flower now forgotten on the floor. The princess had to awkwardly readjust her neck as Alicent stood to leave, her patience as wounded as the petals on the floor. Where are you going? asked Rhaenyra. Home. The hour has grown late. Rhaenyra sighed, then stood up. Princess Nymeria led her Rhoyna across the narrow sea on 10,000 ships to flee their Valyrian pursuers. Still walking away, Alicent opened her book searching for the right chapter to verify the information, but it was so heavy that she had to stop, giving Rhaenyra the chance to catch up. She took Lord Moore's Martell of Dawn to husband and burned her own fleet of Sunspear to show her people that they were finished running. As Alicent looked up from the chapter, Rhaenyra reached for the book and ripped the page off, damaging the intricate illustration as she did so. What are you doing? The princess offered her the sole page. So you remember. I love the presence of the book in this scene, how it feels like Alicent is the one who really cares about history and heritage, but in the end we see that history flows through Rhaenyra's veins. It's more than school and obligations to her, it's part of her 
core. That's why she gets a necklace to wear instead of a book to study. And sure, there were many ways to represent this soft dichotomy, but I love the ripping of the page. It reminds me of another movie I'm quite fond of, and also gives the scene this whole physical touchable aspect. Okay, let's have one last look, this time at the piece of world building that made me go, huh. With you, King Viserys' own chambers. The Valyrian capital was built into a volcano, explained the king as his own gaze guided Alicent's attention from one part of the miniature city to another. The smaller white stone buildings were no taller than a pinky finger, but even those sported lush detail like window designs and supporting columns. And the dragon lords, the highest of the nobility, lived here at the volcanic face, continued him as his eyes moved to the largest building, a pyramidal palace as tall as a sword, towering above its little white counterparts closest to the source of their magic and power. Lady Alicent allowed herself a second to look away from the stone city and into the king's expression. There was something fiery about his shoulders, his voice, his whole self when he enacted those stories in his head as he explained the structure. As if he could really see the minute dragon lords strolling around their white mansions. This was the Anagrion, continued the king, oblivious to her grin, where the blood majors work their craft. It is truly wondrous what you've built, she said, stepping closer to him. Oh no, said Viserys, finally looking away from the city. He saw Lady Alicent looking at the round replica of the Anagrion and smiled, unable to hide his pride. I only pour over the histories and provide the plans. The stonemasons built the structures. Do you believe that Westeros can be another Valyria, your grace? At the pins, said the king without a second of hesitation. Whether you speak of the freehold at its height or at its fall. The king grabbed one of the many movable dragon models, also made of the same rough white stone material, and spun in its hand absentmindedly. Over a thousand dragons, an AV large enough to span the seas of the world. He found one tiny horn too many in the dragon's head, one small enough so he could scrape it out with his thumbnail. The glory of old Valyria will never be seen again. He scratched too hard and the dragon fell to the ground, breaking pieces. Seven else. Again, what a great way to show a relationship. In a way, King Viserys is the creator of that table. He's the one who provided the plans. But at the same time, he's not the one who built it. And when he tries to fiddle with it, he messes up. He admires the power of old Valyria. It's very clear in the emotion in his voice. But at the same time, he's hopeless. He doesn't, he doesn't believe that can exist anymore. And those conflicting emotional states are beautifully symbolized by this miniature city that he chose to put in his own room with the thousand miniature dragons that he does not believe he'll ever see, let alone ride. This whole representation into objects is a great world building device, very effective, very evocative, and in this case, each object had a, an aesthetic of its own. So let's jump from exploration to practice. Let's create our own evocative objects. As you might have guessed, today's exercise is all about the different relationships our characters can have with history. What? History? Is it their country's history, or their family's history, or their species history? I don't know, that is yours to pick. But try to explore this relationship in a complex way. Can you show both love and hate in different ways? Both innovation and permanence? Both pride and fear? Because this is how most of us relate to the past. And I want this relationship to be represented by a physical object in the story. And here you have the same opportunity as House of the Dragon, to use this object as an allegory 
as a representation of how the characters deal with history inside their minds. As always, we will finish off with a writing exercise, a few paragraphs that show this world, this relationship and this object. And I hope you folks write, because uh, recently I've been getting less and less comments with people doing the exercises. I'm not sure if I'm doing anything wrong, so if I am doing something wrong, something different, please let me know, because wow, it makes my day when I read your stories, when I read your little snippets of worlds that you create out of those prompts. It, it's really, Fabulous and I've seen so many great worlds here and with that we go to the last part of the video Which is my take on this exercise just one of infinite possibilities that those rules could create and I'm looking forward to reading yours Okay, let's let's go. Let's go. Let's go Just as a quick intro here, I wrote something following today's prompt, but I realized I was still pretty influenced by some of my old videos, especially the Locke Lamora video about rituals and the Blue Period video about artist characters. So there's some elements of that there as well. <laughs> I'll talk more about it after I read it. Let's have a look at it first. Let's go. The interior of the atelier managed to be even colder than the small hours outside. The artist's steamy breaths looked very much like pocket editions of the haze outside. He did not dare take his coat off, even though somebody had already turned the radiator on. The sculptor was already there, though as per usual she had not cared to turn the lights on. Her hands were covered in wet crimson clay that she was minutiously adding to a head-shaped model on her table. She also did not dare take her coat off, dirtying its cream sleeves with red, butcher-like. As the artist approached, flipping the light switch on and dropping his leather bag to the floor, she froze her hands mid-action. Both acknowledged each other with half a side glance, but neither spoke. The artist thought that was enough, so he set off to work. He unzipped the bag and from inside he produced a bundle of paintbrushes of all sizes. At first, he unceremoniously dropped them all into an empty old bucket, the handles spreading around with a satisfying wooden sound. But just after that, the artist picked two of the scattered brushes and moved them to a separate container, a tall clay vase. He didn't drop the selected brushes there, but placed them carefully. The sculptor scoffed. The artist looked at her, scowling. Are you gonna do this every single time? said the sculptor in a husky voice like chiseled marble, half-frozen. Her hands shook in the cold. They're just brushes, you know. They're not special. Precisely, replied the artist in a wet and well-textured voice. That is why they're special. The sculptor asked no more, concentrating on her crime scene head. As the artist prepared his viridian, cinnabars and maroons, he stared at the two brushes. One was thick, with a brown horsehair tip and was barely touched by its smudges of paint. The other was a very worn out flat tip, covered in layer upon layer of paint to the point of you couldn't tell what had been its original color. The artist knew the two brushes were probably worth more than he'd make that whole year, and yet he had no intention of ever selling them. The first had belonged to Salvador Dali, the second to Jackson Pollock. They were not special. Every day the artist would ritualistically place them among his own unspecial brushes, and then in the clay vase, every single day, even in days when he didn't paint. It was very important for him to look at the brushes and realize they were just brushes, nothing more, nothing less. One well kept, the other one not so much. Not even that mattered. He caught the sculptor glancing at the two brushes with the corner of his eye, and smirked. He then wet his completely ordinary brush with the first green he had selected. The artist made art, and as he did so, he forgot to feel cold. Okay, 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 I know, I know this is not fantasy, I know this is not sci-fi, this is not my bread and butter, and this is not why you folks come here, but I've been having a lot of conversations about oil painting, and this is where my mind gravitated to, I'm sorry, forgive me. Hope you don't mind the unusual 
subject matter. But one thing I wanted to stir away was this medieval aspect of uh, House of the Dragon. Of course, it's fantasy medieval, but uh, I wanted something either much older, inspired by ancient Greece or ancient China, or something maybe even futuristic. In the end, my mind came up with a rather modern scene. I mean, there's Jackson Pollock and there's a radiator. I'm a pantser, folks. I don't get to exactly choose what I write. <laughs> I try to show this artist both giving a lot of value to the brushes, but also taking value away from them, um, considering them incredible and also ordinary all at once. This is what I, I, I. This is the relationship with history I try to build there. I also try to write a character that wants to be part of history, not somebody who already achieved this status. So more longing and wanting and fighting for it rather than having a previous inevitable connection with history just like in House of the Dragon and other fantasy series like uh, Dune and uh, Lord of the Rings. I hope it was to your liking. And that's the end of the video for today. Thank you so much for your patience, folks, because uh, I've been doing a couple of experiments here on the channel with the short videos, so I'm doing a bit less of those longer narrative essays, and I've gotten nothing but support. So thank you so, so much for your support and, and your constant encouragement. It, it means the world. And a special thank you to my patrons who take this encouragement far and above and beyond. I am touched by your generosity. Thank you so much. And I feel something happened after I took some vacations and uh, I'm, I'm learning, I'm learning more. I feel this learning process has sped up and I can't wait to share this more with you folks. Thank you so much for sticking around. I'll see you next time. Bye.